welcome to Med City News' Invest Conference. My name is Orduti Parmar, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Med City News. I do hope that you're regularly visiting our website, medcitynews.com, to read up on the latest news and analysis of healthcare innovation. So today, we're going to be discussing um, how to rebuild trust within minority uh, communities, uh, given that they have suffered the most during uh, COVID-19. Uh, now the vaccines are rolling out, but it's also ro rolling out a little bit inequitably. So our discussion today will address how providers and payers are addressing how they rebuild trust in these vulnerable communities. So our moderator today is Dan Gebremedin, partner at Flair Capital. Dan is a partner and he has led investments into and sits on boards of Somatis and Eden Health. Dan was a practicing internal medicine physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital and had a faculty appointment as an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School from 2010 until 2019. Prior to joining Flair Capital, Dan served as a medical director at the Harvard Pilgrim Health Plan, leading population health analytics, value-based purchasing, and general strategy. Dan also spent time as an entrepreneur and operator in the health IT industry, co-founding and managing two separate businesses in the electronic health records and online medical education industries. Welcome to you, Dan. RJ Briscioni is the Senior Director of Social Determinants of Health Strategy and Execution at CVS Health Aetna. He is part of the newly formed Social Determinants of Health Strategy and Execution team within Aetna Strategy and Consumer Experience, where he focuses on national scale partnerships that support CVS Health Aetna's destination health platform to focus on community health and address social determinant gaps. Prior to this role, RJ led Medicaid business development for Aetna's East region, leading teams in all stages of proposal response for multi-year Medicaid management care contracts. He holds a BS in aeronautics from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Welcome to you, RJ. Dr. Takesha Davis is the CEO of New Orleans East Hospital. She has spent the last 10 years at the Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals, where she served as the director of the Center for Community and Preventive Health, medical director and assistant state health officer for the Office of Public Health. Dr. Davis is a New Orleans native who earned a doctorate of medicine from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and a master's in public health from Harvard University. She has extensive experience in clinical care, community engagement, and healthcare systems management. Welcome to you, Dr. Davis. Next, we have Dr. Adam L. Myers. He's the Chief of Population Health and Director of Cleveland Clinic Community Care. Dr. Myers started in a new role in the Cleveland Clinic in June 2018, and it encompasses leadership of several ambulatory practices spanning from pediatrics to ger geriatrics, as well as the Center for Value-Based Research, the Center for Functional Medicine, Medical Care at Home, the ACO Structure, the 7,400 member clinically integrated network, three residency programs, the geriatrics fellowship and community relations for the enterprise. In addition, he leads the care model design efforts and the community health strategy for the Cleveland Clinic. Myers received his undergrad degree from the Centenary College of Louisiana in Shreveport. He also holds a master's in healthcare management from Harvard University. Welcome Dr. Myers. So now I'm very excited to hand this over to Dan, who will moderate the panel and shepherd this really important discussion. Please take it away, Dan. Thank you, Arundhati. Really appreciate that intro. Uh, we're excited to dive into this important discussion, uh, rebuilding trust, You know how health systems and payers are seeking to address gaps in, in care for minorities. We've got a great panel. Um, so why don't we just dive right into it? Uh, Takesha, you know, I might I might start with you. Um, do we need to rebuild trust with the minority community to attack disparities in care? You know, in, in answering your question, love for you to talk about some of the work that your organization is doing on these fronts. Absolutely, uh, and thank you, Dan, uh, for the question. Um, we owe it to the minority community uh, to rebuild trust. Um, we know that there has historically uh, been systemic racism uh, in the healthcare system. Uh, from every aspect, from healthcare delivery uh, to the training of our healthcare professionals uh, to um, the, the scientific studies that have been done. 
uh, it's been a well-studied, well-published, everything from the Tuskegee study uh, to the misuse of Henrietta Lacks' cells. Uh, so we need to acknowledge this openly, loudly, um, that there were flaws in the way uh, in which we treated minority communities, which have led uh, to the underlying healthcare disparities that we see today. Uh, so our job now uh, is once we acknowledge it, is to say, how are we going to change it? Uh, at my hospital, um, New Orleans East Hospital, uh, in our healthcare system, uh, we're doing some innovative work uh, to first say to the minority community that we are in partnership with them. Far too long uh, have we as healthcare providers, myself included, uh, as a physician, um, been a part of the very patriarchal um, healthcare system where we have told people um, what they should do, um, what's best for them. Uh, we have not educated them and empowered them to be a part of the decision-making and how uh, they can improve the health and wellness of their communities. Uh, so through our community uh, activation board that was started four years ago, we provide them data good, bad, and ugly uh, about what we see in our hospital, uh, what we see with our preventable healthcare disorders. And we started really focusing in on diabetes because uh, we have seen at any given time, 30% of our patients uh, are diabetics. Uh, and there was a lot of return visits uh, for lack of education, uh, created a diabetes center with the help of trusted community members. Uh, and they said to us, it's great for you to invite us into the community, but what you do is still tell us, hey, you need to eat more fruits and vegetables. You need to walk more, but we can't uh, in our community. And so we now have created a walking trail uh, around our hospital uh, because it's safe, it's lit, uh, and uh, it's paved. We also have twice a month um, farmer's market on our hospital campus um, as hospital providers we have to start using some of the tried and tested public health maneuvers uh, to be able to tackle the social determinants of health. And that's how we're going to really be able to change the relationship that we've had with minority communities. Really, really important concepts there. Um, you know, there is a lot of, you know, societal issues uh, and systemic issues that we have to kind of overcome. And I love the concept of kind of meeting these patients where they are and and incorporating them in, in, in their daily lives, right? Not just about, you know, medical issues, but also just, you know, public health in general. So really, really important concepts. Adam, I know uh, through your work with the Cleveland Clinic, you guys spend a lot of time, you know, in the community. What are your thoughts? Do we need to rebuild trust uh, with the minority community? What is the sort of work that Cleveland Clinic is doing? Absolutely, trust is essential and it is importantly lacking from uh, from the conversation. And it is a, a well-earned, as Takesha said, lack of trust. I mean, historical reality has uh, validated that lack of trust over and over again. And I think trust, in addition to our actions, uh, comes from seeking first to understand the felt needs of people. Oftentimes, we as you know, educated leaders in the healthcare space seem to believe that we understand what other people need. And that goes back to that paternalistic nature that we have. Um, and, you know, rather than doing so, seeking to understand first and help people give voice to their needs as the, and then partner with them, being willing to partner rather than own it all uh, and come riding in with preformed solutions. Instead, partner with them uh, to fill the needs that they have expressed after we've uh, gained understanding of those. You know, another component of this that I think is important and uh, something that we've done is to join with already trusted voices in the community. There are many in communities who have historically been far more trusted than healthcare providers and systems. Uh, churches come to mind, places of worship come to mind, community-based organizations come to mind. So. That's another mistake that healthcare systems sometimes make. They'll say, we're gonna do more in the community. And so they build a clinic in the community. And while on the face of it, that sounds good, what they sometimes uh, fail to recognize is that there are already people there doing some of that work. It, you know, Federally qualified health centers come to mind. 
And if we were to, instead of partnering with them and supporting the federally qualified health centers, others doing the work, coming in there, putting our stake in the ground and saying, look, we're here to save the day in the community. And we're gonna build this nice big clinic. As a result, we might put those other people out of business that have been there for decades doing the work that has led to trust. So joining with trusted voices, partnering with them, leaning in on the problems that are voiced by the community uh, are key elements of this. And so we, we're taking that approach at the clinic. It's not always been the approach of healthcare organizations writ large and hasn't always been the approach at the clinic. Several years back, there was a purposeful decision to take a different approach and it started with listening. The listening that oftentimes leads to our community health needs assessment uh, was part of that process. And that's a, an every three years uh, process where those who participate in, in uh, government billing, uh, collections rather with CMS, have to go through this, this uh, uh, you know, tr every three year process of listening to the community, assessing and putting together a strategy document about how they're going to potentially meet those needs in the community. Well, historically for healthcare systems, that has been a fairly perfunctory process that led to a nice little binder on the wall that you could stick on the shelf and say, I have checked the box, I have done the community health needs assessment, now we can move on with the business at hand. We have decided to do it differently and to make that document a living, breathing document that informs our strategy in facing the community. And as a result of doing so, we've come up with a, a very comprehensive strategy that goes into three different verticals and that's heal, hire, and invest. Heal is about taking care to where people are rather than making them come to us, ensuring that they have the type of meaningful access where they live, learn, work, play, and worship. Uh, hire is trying to create a situation where the communities can become stronger through better employment and such that we do more hiring from those local communities so that we can begin to look and be more like the communities that we are serving and be more reflective of those that we serve. So that's a, a layer of inclusivity that I think is important as well. And then invest, you know, the structural racism components that uh, Takesha described are not just in healthcare, they are in our community writ large. And I know we're gonna probably talk a little bit more about that down the, down the line, but investing in our communities in such a way that as anchor institutions, our strength can become the strength of those that surround us is important as well. So investing in small businesses, investing in affordable housing, investing in uh, a variety of different uh, programs to help support the communities as part of that heal, hire, and invest. Oh, really, really great insights there, Adam. It's a great framework. He'll hire and invest. I hear a lot of concepts around listening, but then also partnering with trusted organizations, uh, you know, in, in the community. And, and, and sometimes, you know, the, the best or the good intentions of, of institutions sometimes can, can fall short for, for, for those reasons. Um, really great concepts there. Um, RJ, uh, you know, CVS uh, Health, uh, such a broad organization, yeah. both retail, uh, footprint, as well as, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of a health plan, and, and they have some, some, some provider capacity as well. Uh, curious how you guys are thinking about uh, disparities uh, in care and health equity. Yeah, so, so very similar, you know, we, we traded notes earlier, and, and Adam, Adam and I's approach is uh, and not, not that it's mine, but um, the CBS Aetna's is, is really about, is shifting to I will say it's not there yet is meeting people where they are. Um, and it is um, getting into the community and getting to, to those trusted organizations um, and letting people um, kind of approach us in a way through those uh, trusted organizations. So I think we'll talk about COVID specifically, but, but in the, in the COVID um uh, testing and especially with vaccines. And, and I made the point internally, others made this as well. When we shifted from testing to vaccines, I think there's a big difference there, right? Um, what the 
you know, kind of anybody would would probably be likely to come and get a test that they might need a test or, or might be concerned to do that. But then taking the step of the vaccine um, due to the trust issues and, and um, concerns that Takesha mentioned earlier, right? So we have um, built a very large, truly national strategy around um, trusted organizations, um, a very specific health equity um, uh, framework to, to um, reserve times so that those with better web access don't get to jump the line, so to speak, um, that we've been testing and iterating on for weeks and weeks and weeks. We can get into that, I think, when we talk COVID details. Um, but, but it really is about, both from the CVS side, recognizing that, that, that we have a couple different levels of trust, I think, in, in CVS. And, and in fact, we put a, um, we did a little article on, on this a, a couple months ago that the, uh, the research that we have on the level of trust at, that your neighborhood pharmacist has is as high or higher um, than, than your doctor in, in many cases, right? So we think about social determinants, we think about health equity, about how do we use the, the folks inside that pharmacy. Like my wife, you know, we, we're very fortunate that I work for CVS and there's a CVS on our corner here um, in Atlanta um, that, that my wife knows that pharmacist and just walks up and asks her about stuff for, for my kids all the time, right? And, and, but when you, you think about that, how we show up in minority communities for that, realizing um, that we have ways to go there um, and and then building some strategies around that for where our pharmacies are not and where our folks are not. And then also recognizing that, um, you know, your Aetna insurer um, may not be the most trusted organization in the world, right, for, for, for members to approach, but then building out strategies to, to approach that through community-based organizations. So we've done a pretty large scale um, and growing um, set of pilots with, with Unite Us that builds um, uh, networks of community-based organizations so that we can refer folks um, to um, community-based organizations for any number of social determinants needs. And then really as, the, as, as COVID has, um, has shown up and, and our role in testing and vaccines, um, partnering with, with organizations so that they are the front. There may be people in, in CVS lab coats at these places, you know, sort of to Adam's point, there's, if you go down the street here in Atlanta, we're at the Good Samaritan Health Center, which is a very um, well-known neighborhood um, clinic in a, in a minority uh, dominant area. We're not going to set up a big giant CVS um, facility in there, right? That is Good Samaritan Health Center's facility. There's some CVS folks running it, but there's also Good Samaritan folks running it. And the people in that neighborhood know the, the doctors and, and the folks that are have been providing the care at Good Samaritan. The churches around there, we're engaging. Um, we have an engagement strategy through our workforce development. So it's so very similar to Adam's approach, but coming at it from, from our CVS and Aetna lens. No, uh, RJ, really, really insightful comments around integration. You, you said something that is just so powerful uh, that I just kind of want to, you know, repeat in my own words, um, that, that many of these communities have been ignored uh, for, 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 for a long time. Uh, and there is a lack of trust. There is a lack of goodwill. Um, and when a crisis occurs, right, yeah. and you need to mobilize the community, if that trust isn't there, it's not going to work. Right. Yep. And you know, enter the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, so Takesha, I want to kind of kick it back to you. I, mean, I know your uh, hospital system is on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, just from a medical perspective, but from uh, a disparities perspective and an equity pr perspective, how have you seen COVID-19 exacerbate some of the issues that were already there? Uh, absolutely. Uh, as RJ mentioned, the, the communities uh, that uh, our hospital system serves, which is uh, largely um, minority community, uh, over 60% uh, on Medicaid, uh, so um, uh, on a public payer source, uh, lower socioeconomic status um, from a childhood through um, uh, the life's uh, journey. Um, we have been dealing with um, disparate health outcomes um, for decades. Uh, so uh, COVID-19 did not 
um, bring awareness to this issue for, for any of us, I think, on this um, panel. Um, but it was a great illuminator uh, and continues to be an illuminator uh, for many uh, who may not have been aware uh, of the preventable debts uh, that minorities experience from um, the consequences of diabetes, heart disease, cancer, not having equitable access uh, because uh, unfortunately uh, for months, uh, many people were uh, quarantined and forced um, to watch um, these disparities um, play out on national TV uh, where uh, we saw uh, that there were hot spots in our hospital was one in New Orleans uh, where uh, a predominantly minority uh, community uh, was being disproportionately impacted uh, by COVID-19 early on because uh, of the underlying social determinants of health uh, that drive their daily lives. Uh, they were in um, professions uh, that had high contact and hospitality, um, in professions that did not have uh, the ability for them to have paid time off, so they could not um, just stay home or if they came into contact with someone uh, who um, potentially was at risk, they could not quarantine in their homes uh, because they may have lived in multi-generational homes. Uh, and then the lack of health literacy or equitable understanding uh, of those risks, uh, access to testing, all played out uh, in real time um, for us at our hospital. Unfortunately, um, one of my um, valued healthcare staff, one of our nurses, Larice Anderson, was the first nurse uh, in our state uh, to succumb uh, to uh, COVID-19. Uh, and that uh, was because of the fact that as we were taking care uh, of patients, and we all remember this, um, there was ever-changing guidelines uh, about uh, who uh, should be tested. You had to have traveled to Wuhan, China uh, in those early weeks uh, to be thought to be at risk. Uh, and so the educational components um, also that put us at risk uh, and provided some illumination. What that has done though, uh, from a positive aspect, uh, is that as we continue to sound the alarm, um, there were more resources because there were more individuals in their capacity bringing um, their ability intentionally uh, to this fight uh, because we now had a, a shared risk. Um, uh, as RJ mentioned, these communities have been long ignored uh, because there was not uh, a thought of personal risk uh, to those who lived in other parts of town or had greater financial means. Um, but now with COVID-19 and being in a pandemic, there was a shared risk um, that an individual sitting next to you could potentially bring uh, a life-threatening disease to you. Uh, so we have seen a very um, different interest uh, in partnerships uh, and the ability uh, and openness to listen, as Adam stated, uh, to what has caused these disparities. Uh, and it's led to some really uh, innovative partnerships in our community uh, that may not uh, have happened uh, as soon as they did. Uh, we've had large uh, corporations like Johnson & Johnson and uh, pairs like Centene to come in and want to work on social determinants of health, um, providing uh, mobile units and opportunities for us, uh, as RJ so uh, eloquently mentioned, to shift um, from a mindset uh, for them of patients coming to them. But as we have um, touted our model, we've moved from patient first to community first. Uh, and how do we help to elevate the health of our communities uh, and change our mindset uh, from looking at patients and pair mix uh, and uh, how we can increase uh, our profitability and margins to how we can increase the wellness uh, of our communities overall. Um, I think that the COVID-19 uh, vaccine distribution process, uh, as was mentioned by RJ, uh, has allowed us an opportunity uh, to intentionally create equity uh, in the process and bring vaccines to communities who may not uh, have been prioritized uh, for previous medications or vaccinations. But now um, we understand a bit better the need uh, through an equity lens uh, to prioritize those communities that were most disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 as a disease, um, they should receive uh, the same sort of priority uh, for vaccination. Uh, it should not be based upon how we have normally weighted 
um, access into the healthcare system, which has been financial or political means. Super, super important points uh, to Keisha. You know, that concept of shared risk, right? Uh, that we're all in this together uh, is so important. Um, and it, it's, it's really unfortunate. You know, I'm sorry to hear about that member of your staff. I know many of us, you know, have you know, uh, family members, you know, kind of, you know, first degree folks that, you know, have been affected by the pandemic. And it's unfortunate that uh, it's taken this crisis um, to, you know, highlight the needs uh, uh, of, 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 of the, you know, kind of diverse communities. Uh, but perhaps there is there is a silver lining there. Um, I think so. I think yeah, it's been think so. part of our solution. You know, RJ mentioned, we get this question often too from our community members, you know, why are people interested in us now? Right. Why are you bringing the vaccine to me now? And there's a healthy skepticism there, sure. right? Yeah, yeah, you, for sure. You haven't brought cancer medication and innovation yeah. to my community. So why COVID-19? Are you bringing the vaccine? Are you experimenting on me? <laughs> you know, we've gotten those questions. And, and our answer has been, listen, this is because there is a shared risk uh, and everybody understands it, um, that if we don't get to 80, 85 percent of our community at large, irrespective of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status vaccinated, we'll never get back uh, to the normalcy that we all desire and crave. Um, so it's just the transparency and honesty in the conversation and acknowledging that we haven't pro properly prioritized these communities, but maybe this is an opportunity to start. Yeah, very well said. So, so RJ, want to get you in here. I know you, you yeah, talked a thanks. little bit about, you know, kind of COVID uh, testing and vaccination, and then maybe you can also kind of touch on some of the skepticism that sure. you're seeing, you know, from the communities that you guys serve. Yeah, yeah, happy to. And, and uh, you know, thanks to Keisha. The, I, I do want to talk about the approach because I couldn't, um, you know, I've, I've worked in to get you either in in Medicaid or um, or this health equity social determinant space for my, my whole healthcare career. Um, and I couldn't be prouder of the shift and the effort and the amount of resources that that CVS uh, as a company is is throwing at this equity issue. So I want to talk a little bit about that, Dan, about how we're approaching it and the fact that like what doesn't work last week gets thrown out this week, for, you know, for a new approach. So, um, you know, the, the first thing we did in the states where, where I believe we're up to 29 states right now where we have the federal pharmacy program, right, where we're the lead um, for that for that program and we have a fairly wide distribution in the states. So to to um, to address the equity population, we took the um, the highest where the highest social vulnerability index is the CV, CDC social vulnerability index and um, targeted those stores, meaning that we we shipped more vaccine to those stores and then held back those appointments, as I mentioned earlier, right? Like the first week we, we started the whole thing up and said, here we go. Well, I think, I think I mentioned this when we were preparing, Dan, like the first week, all the appointments were gone in five minutes. Like I may be exaggerating a little bit, but, but roughly five minutes, you know, because you can get on the web, you can kind of figure out when those appointments are going to unlock. And so we said, okay, we're going to figure out different ways to um, hold back for the equity populations. And this is where, um, you know, the, the genius of having a, a CVS combined with an Aetna um, it, it really comes into play, right? Because our Aetna folks in Medicaid um, and Medicare, and especially the duals have teams on the ground in all of these states and all of these cities that, that frankly, their job is to be um, connected to the community organizations and to have relationships with those community organizations. So we're holding back, um, and I say holding back, that's, that doesn't sound right, but we're reserving equity appointments um, and they are going through those organizations. So our folks who have the relationships are sending the information on how to register for these equity appointments to those, um, to those trusted organizations that we have on the ground um, that are either, you know, uh, that are, that are black churches or, or any kind of um, Hispanic aligned organizations, the, the effort, um, you know, from, from CDC and, and even white house guidance is to um, try to maximize black and, and Hispanic opportunities. Right. And so 
we're giving those organizations time to get that information out to their uh, membership and to their list and to, and to the, the people that they know and then letting them register first before we open up the broader, right? And so that that has been working fairly well. Takesha, that's actually live in New Orleans this week. Actually, we, we, we picked up uh, uh, picked up Louisiana uh, and, and Alabama in the last week or so. Um, so um, so that, uh, that effort, and then, um, you know, I won't go into all the details, but a ton of effort from our, all of the different data sources, you know, we're, we're often um, decried in, in some ways for the amount of data we sit on. Frankly, sometimes we're not perfect at, at how we utilize it, but we do know many people um, across, when you think about the, the depth and breadth of, of people who fill pharmacy at CVS, people who fill, um, who are Caremark members um, and who are uh, Aetna members, that's a pretty good uh, swath of the American population. Um, and we, we know generally if they are black or Hispanic and if they're in those zip codes. And so a major effort outbound to them via, via calls from, from live agents um, and texts uh, to, to try to make that happen. So, um, you know, results vary based on geography and, and based on, you know, where we have some of those relationships better on the ground. Um, but that, you know, that's the effort in a nutshell. Um, the, and also actually there's a, there's a whole, there's another arm to it that I, that I should mention where we have, um, especially where we have Aetna, um, our, our public and labor teams that have relationships with, um, uh, when you think about things like city employees and state employees, you know, when you're thinking about everybody from teachers to sanitation workers to, the, you know, the, the kind of um, folks that Takesha mentioned that really don't have the ability to um, to take time off or to get time. We have uh, relationships with mayors and um, city councils and folks like that that can help us get the word out so that that's working well in other places as well. So, so that's the effort. There is... Um, Dan, I think I mentioned this. We're we're putting out a, a bi-monthly research on the hesitancy. So we don't. I don't think we have the March um, back just yet. But interestingly, and we have this out on on uh, it's on cbshealth.com. Um, we're doing a monthly survey on hesitancy, and so from November to January, uh, overall hesitancy went down. Um, but it did go up, um, not insignificantly in black and Hispanic populations. I think all of these efforts that we've been doing since then, we, we basically picked this up in, in, in mid January was when the vaccine distribution started, uh, kind of in earnest from, from our perspective, right? There was a little bit in December, but that was mostly in the, in the long-term care facility. Um, so, um, so we're ho we believe that it's, that it's gotten better. We can see in some of the results, um, that we're, we're making improvements based on the, the population. But um, I, I think there's still ways to go. I really do think the answer is through those community organizations, through the, through the um, relationships that some of our teams have with, with black churches and other organizations like that. Uh, yeah. no, super, super, uh, no, yeah, super helpful, um, you know, kind of viewpoint from the front lines. I mean, this is all unfolding as we speak. As so we speak for, for real. And it changes every week. And we, we try new things every week to, to make it a little bit better. That's great. Uh, you know, Adam, want to want to loop you in here. I know, um, you know, from a solutions perspective, uh, the Cleveland Clinic has been very data driven uh, in thinking about uh, your approach uh, to disparities of care, um, you know, and, and health equity, you know, you talk a little bit about something called the deprivation index. So I'd love to just better understand your playbook, how you're tackling some of these issues, you know, and some of the solutions that you guys put forth. Yeah, thank you so much. Just as the uh, RJ and Takesha have said, the health disparities that we are witnessing right now are neither unique or new. They're not unique to COVID and they're not new. They are the result of centuries of deprivation for many people in our society that result from societal structural racism uh, that have denied people the access to uh, education, safe housing, transportation, meaningful wages, judicial equity, and any number of other areas that have held people back. 
And it is uh, all of us as individuals have social needs as individual people. If you aggregate the social needs of given communities, then those are what we call the social determinants of health for those communities. A standardized way to capture the aggregate deprivation within a discrete geography is a measure called the area deprivation index. It is a standard measure that uh, is available in the literature that really captures the impact of those social determinants on people's lives. And we have found that that, that degree of deprivation, uh, and again, it's not new, but the degree of deprivation closely correlates with outcomes and life expectancy. You know, in, why should it be that we have maternal and child mortality in communities across the United States and in Northeast Ohio that for minorities is twice the rate uh, as far as the death rate for, for black babies? It's twice the rate that it is for white babies. Why is that? Why is the life expectancy in one zip code maybe 10 years shorter than an adjacent zip code? Why, why is that? It all comes back to the aggregate impact of those social determinants that result from the, the societal structural racism that, that come to a point in the deprivation index. And what we have done is we've used that area deprivation index to do a couple of things to prioritize short-term interventions, such as uh, providing uh, PPE, food stuff, uh, cleaning supplies where it's needed most for uh, targeting it, it to where we know there will be hotspots. It's not a surprise that these areas with the high area deprivation impact are gonna be impacted. You don't need to wait and see if it's once again going to be true because we know it is going to be true. So start with looking at those data and then focusing your interventions there. And we did so for our testing efforts and we're leaning in now in the same way for, um, for our vaccination efforts. And when we started to test more purposefully in those regions with a high ADI, we saw the disparate outcomes between them and the areas that didn't have as high an ADI. When we partnered with local organizations to get the materials and supplies that were needed to the people who were suffering, we saw that gap close. Now that's for a time and a place, but in order to really close it long-term, it had, you have to counter the deprivation itself, the long-term deprivation. And, and I'll just bring out one additional example about how COVID really exacerbated some of these issues. And you hear people talk about the digital divide. It's real. Uh, if you don't have broadband access, you have found yourself at limited access to education, jobs, healthcare, and let's think about what happened during the pandemic. Well, we started working remotely where possible. And if we weren't remotely, it was because you were either didn't have a job or you were in a job where you were required to come face to face, as Takesha said, and therefore putting you and your families at risk. But if you didn't have broadband access because the area where you live doesn't have it reliably, then you're out of luck from the standpoint of working remotely. All at the same time, schools became remote, all right? And so, so you've got people trying to work at home, people trying to school at home without that connectivity. Many of the social structures and things that they've grown to know and love from support also went away during that time. And so the additionally, during that time, face-to-face -face healthcare transitioned toward virtual healthcare. So, part of the very solution that was needed to counter the pandemic was almost completely unavailable to many because of the broadband de uh, deficits. And so one of the things that we did was recognized where those areas with that deprivation existed, worked with others in the community to get broadband access on an emergent basis within those neighborhoods such that they could have access to the things that were needed. And we found it to be impactful. Now, ultimately we talked about the area deprivation index, which is uh, the aggregate of a community. We're now leaning in to focus and create what 
and we're doing some research on what might be called a vulnerability index for an individual. I know there's some work out there, but this would be a merging of yeah. a person's ADI with their own discrete healthcare risks and comorbidities to come up with an individualized vulner vulnerability index that can help us really prioritize efforts. So that's the way we're approaching it. And it's, uh, it's proven impactful uh, for us. Oh, super, super insightful, Adam. I mean, that's such a, a compelling and important concept, this digital divide, right? You know, it has nothing to do with healthcare, but it impacts healthcare, right? As you think about access. Well, if you think about it, I mean, the whole concept on social determinants is that it's very clearly recognized that 80% of health outcomes are not from things traditionally associated with healthcare. I mean, only 20% of health outcomes are are uh, associated with what we traditionally have felt we bring to the table in healthcare. So if we want to impact the entire 100% of the opportunity, we have to get outside of our own walls and engage in a different way of thinking and doing. You know, and Adam, I, I may stay on this topic, uh, so many good topics for us to discuss uh, in our time together, but uh, I do feel like the elephant in the room, at, at least, you know, from my perspective, oftentimes when we start talking about social determinants, uh, disparities in care, that there are a lot of societal issues at play, yet it's healthcare organizations that have to kind of jump in. And so what are your thoughts, Adam, when pe critics of, of, of a lot of the conversation that we're having today that, you know, why is, why is healthcare having to solve a poverty issue. How do you think about that, Adam? Yeah, I would say, I don't think we're forced to solve it. I think we can choose to participate in solving it if we want to, and I hope we will. If we want to, as I said, be more impactful on more than 20% of the health outcomes, we must choose to enter into the world of poverty and deprivation. Otherwise, we just simply won't. Be. If an area's deprivation is at the core of the health inequities, then mitigation of that deprivation is the answer. It's bigger than us as individual health systems. It will take community-wide collaborative efforts. We cannot do it all, but we alone can do our part, and being willing to lean in is critical. Yeah, uh, Dakesha, I want to I want to I want to loop you in here. Uh, but I'm going to add a second question, another weighty <laughs> question. So you should address I'm the poverty test issue. harder now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Address that one. But then also, and then our other panelists will, will chime in here. I, is there a business case for uh, addressing kind of health equity? Because I know you talked a little bit about, you know, thinking about margin and profile, but yeah, t touch on those things. Uh, because that'd be great. Absolutely. As uh, Adam stated, uh, as healthcare um, entities, um, it's not solely our responsibility to try to solve the social determinants of health, um, but there are several motivators uh, for us uh, to lead here uh, and to participate, to partner, um, as we have stated many times over with those community voices, organizations that are already doing trusted work in this area. Um, but there is most definitely the business case. Uh, as we see the costs of healthcare uh, in the United States continuing to skyrocket while we continue to have the same poor results in disparate health outcomes, um, we have to intentionally tackle where the disparities and you know the, the 10 to 20% of individuals that are driving um, the healthcare costs up, how we can improve that. And oftentimes it's because of the social determinants, uh, the area deprivation, uh, as Adam mentioned, that is outside of the four walls of the hospitals and clinics that we have to partner um, with organizations uh, in education, social justice, looking at food insecurity, um, poverty, uh, as to how do we get to the underlying causes of um, these disparate health outcomes, these unnecessary and preventable healthcare costs in our system um, to really be able to then drive um, to what we ultimately are in this for, which is to improve wellness. The last piece I'll say, and hopefully RJ can speak to this, the more that we have um, payers uh, in uh, our systems that are driving us uh, to quality and improvement in health outcomes, that also gives us added incentive 
uh, for uh, healthcare organizations to move in this direction. And a lot of times the work that we need to do again is not around adding additional providers or resources uh, in our four walls, but partnering with those who can help to improve um, the educational and um, financial status through workforce development uh, of our communities to allow them the empowerment to be able to have better health outcomes. That's a, a perfect segue, RJ. Uh, yeah. Now you're on the hot seat. I think you have the of unique course. distinction of being yeah. a panelist uh, from a, a big for-profit company. Uh, and yep. so everything that you do has to have a business case. So for sure. how do you think about for making sure. the business case for social determinants um, you know, within CBS? Yeah. yeah, this is what this is this is what we're doing. Um, and 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 we're we're doing it. Um, you know, I think we're we're figuring it out now, right? Like this this whole I know this is going to sound bad for, for us, for, for those of us here, but like the full embrace of social determinants and, and zooming out a bit to health equity is new, right? So first is the, is the data. Adam mentioned that, like, how do we get that data? Um, and, and we do have some pilots um, uh, starting with getting that individualized data um, for our members, Um with, you know, I'll, I'll have to give a shout out. I, I, we can't take all the credit for this. So, so um, a relatively new ish startup socially determined, which is probably the most brilliantly named startup ever um, in, in our space. So um, shout out to that team, but what they're able to do, and this is something we want to do on a much broader scale, right? Across all of our businesses is find those members with rising social risk. Like this is my whole reason for being right now, if we find those members with the rising social risk prior to them having this, these high cost health cares, like right now we're directing members into these social determinants uh, or into these community-based organizations through care management. Well, if they're in care management, if they're in our care management program, we basically already failed them, right? Like, the, like they're already, the, you know, they're, they're already either high cost or at or at pretty extreme risk of high cost and showing up on the kind of, you know, what I'll call the traditional medical radar, right? So if we can take, um, you know, at, at relatively low cost, um, the whole stratification of those members social risk and what they do is, is I think, unique and novel. And they break it down for us in, um, I think it's like it's seven different categories. I'm probably going to miss one, but they're a lot of the things we've talked about, right? Like an individual score for financial strain, for food insecurity, housing, um, transportation, something that we've touched on that we may not have named specifically, but we sort of have that I've spent a lot of time thinking about how we get to is that is health literacy, right? Takesha and Adam, you, you've each mentioned it, right? It, it shows up in in all of those other things. Um, and, and so if, we aim like like take the example of health literacy, right? So if you're find somebody, um, if you happen to recognize them and they happen to want to be engaged and they're pre-diabetic, right? And you're throwing these apps or um, care management or engagement programs at them for pre-diabetic, and they don't know what you're talking about, um, and they don't understand the language that the care manager's speaking in, you know. So so then we've got a member engaged, you know. For for us, that's you know quote engaged, but are they truly engaged because we have, we don't know what their health literacy is, right? So all of those things, um, if we can get at all of that, understand the, the rising social risk, we can then quantify the, the, what the total cost of care would be without some of the social interventions, um, how we can get to some avoidable utilization, some, some quality, uh, some quality measures, and then really like the, the end goal you know, we're, we're not close to this yet, but well, we're getting closer to it is to, is to be able to, to pay um, folks like Takesha and Adam for quality improvements. And, and actually we do have some stuff coming on this. I think, well, not, I think I know uh, that will probably launch early next year on how do we pay you for quality improvements on the members social uh, on, on the member social determinants where we can measure it, right? So we're, we're going to be starting small with that, but that's where we need to go, right? Like, like if we're going to talk about this and say that we're going to do it, then we have to put something out there that, that 
can be measured. And if we measure the improvement, then the, and, and the providers engage on, uh, on working to improve, or even the first step more is really getting the, getting more measurement around, around the member's social risk, right? Like, so, you know, give us more Z codes and, and we'll, you know, we'll come up with a, with a, a value system for that. Right. So, um, I think that's where, that's where we all need to go. Um, and, and that's, you know, we're, we're heading there in small steps. Do you, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how many of my bosses are going to watch this, but you don't turn an aircraft carrier around on a dime. Um, so, um, it's, it's not, it's not simple or easy to, to, uh, to completely turn this, but, but we're, we're making the, making headway now. You know, yeah, if you think about RJ, it on a macro you know, we, level, uh, oh yeah, around, please, please go ahead, Adam. Yeah. Per, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 please, please, Adam. Yeah, I'll make it quick. Uh, about 51% of the federal budget is a combination of social security and healthcare. 51%. It's yep. about 18% of our GDP. Yep. It's one of the largest growing costs for all businesses. It's simply not a sustainable curve. Yeah. Uh, so the business case, in addition to these discrete businesses that we've just dis discussed, is we've got to do something different. We have to have different outcomes because we just simply can't afford it. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, spending less on the cost of healthcare will be will leave more for other contributions to people's lives and the growing of businesses. And then if you also yeah. think about it, how do we get there? If it's by impacting the ADIs, then developing housing, educational opportunities, yeah. community development, broadband, all of those rep individually sure. represent business opportunities in and of themselves. You just have to think about it a little differently For sure. uh, in order to get there. Yeah. To the, I know, Dan, you were going to jump in with something. To that point, Adam, something I should have mentioned I, um, is that We've we as a company have always invested in 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 affordable housing. I say always, but for for a long time. But for the first time, um, we are investing in affordable housing, aligned with where we have for for example in in Orlando where we have a um, Medicaid pilot with this. It's the state of Florida's pilot um, for um, for folks that are experiencing homelessness that have co-occurring BH and physical needs, right? And so we've invested in housing specific for that. In addition to that, there's a there's CVS Project Health, which is a set of uh, community um, free screenings and, and health engagement opportunities, right? That's, that's actually put on by our foundation that wraps around that. So we're able to bring housing investments, the, the actual Medicaid, business wrapped around these, this um, pilot for members experiencing homelessness with the housing investments. For the, so we're, we're, we're really starting to align the housing investment piece with, the, with our social determinants um, work at, at a much, much greater scale that has the ability to impact uh, much more so than, than kind of just traditional um, you know, housing investments. I did want to get that in there, sorry. Yeah, no, no, this is a really great discussion. I mean, again, you guys are really making the case for why everybody should pay attention, you know, to uh, health equity disparities of care. And I think it's so impactful. Um, you know, in the last five minutes or so, uh, I think we've done a great job of, you know, kind of documenting, um, you know, the real gaps in care uh, that exist. But let's, uh, you know, for all the entrepreneurs in the audience, you know, let's think about innovation. Uh, what's next? Let's let's provide some hope for our audience. And you know, as as a venture capitalist, we invest in some of these early stage companies. And so I, I'll be uh, you know all ears for for the remaining portion of the conversation. You know, Dakisha, maybe start with you. You you've talked to me a, a lot about some of these innovative things that you're doing with private industry, with pharma companies, with, with payers. Maybe talk a little bit about that, and maybe areas where you see opportunities for innovation in in, in tackling disparities in care. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity uh, right now with us looking at um, mobile monitoring uh, for patients as we think about bringing uh, healthcare uh, to uh, communities where they are. Uh, as Adam mentioned early on, how do we heal our communities? Uh, well, it's meeting them where they are. Uh, and in order for us to be able to do that effectively, 
uh, we will be, we need to give them the tools, um, everything from the, the broadband access, but the actual tangible tools uh, to be able to measure um, their success uh, or opportunities for improvement in between um, our routine visits, uh, but also bring to them innovation um, as well. Uh, so I'm really um, looking at how we um, pivot uh, and take um, the investments that we have in our mobile units and um, do things uh, like I mentioned uh, in our, our conversation before, you know, if we're able to have um, mobile um, gaming vans to pull up for birthday parties where I can have pods uh, with five or six boys playing games uh, in front of my house, uh, then I surely should be able uh, to bring a pod like bus uh, to a community uh, with uh, lower access, uh, maybe geographically distanced from specialists um, and bring to them mm -hmm. healthcare where they can get onto that van, get their monitoring done uh, by uh, a nurse or medical assistant and go into pod A to talk to their cardiologist. Pod, pod B might be their nephrologist. Pod C may be an oncologist, um, but bring those specialty services that oftentimes uh, in our healthcare world um, are scarce uh, because of the lower number of providers. Um, and we so often have caused people to have to travel very far. So we're, we're very much working towards how do we do that and provide communities that access to higher level care at higher frequencies right in their community uh, and, and bring the wraparound services, right? So it's one thing uh, for us to say, hey, we can bring healthcare out there, whether it's at, with the partnership with FQAC or on a souped up uh, mobile unit. Um, but then when we leave, uh, are we leaving that community with the resources necessary to be well and healthy? So investing uh, as we have talked about um, during our call, uh, in the educational system, investing uh, in community gardening projects, working with the trusted voices and listening as to what their needs are and being open uh, to changing our mindset and going upstream to improve their health and wellness. Great, great, great comments. Adam, same question for you, uh, you know, opportunities for innovation. Uh, what's next in uh, tackling disparities? Yeah, I think it's about being creative, listening, partnering, and then being willing to stay in the effort. Um, and it's going to mean different things for different people. But unfortunately, one of the barriers has often been for both healthcare and other businesses that people look for quick targeted fixes to problems that took hundreds of years to evolve. Yeah. Yeah. And it simply doesn't work that way. You can have outcomes for the short term, but to have sustainable progress, it takes sustained effort. So be willing to stay in that effort would be the, the guidance and, and advice I might give to all of us as healthcare providers, but also to uh, potential investors or companies yeah. interested in, in making a difference. Super important to consider. Uh, RJ, uh, final thoughts. I know you mentioned uh, a few early stage companies. I'm yeah. very appreciative of the uh, of the plug. Yeah, yeah the shout but, outs, you know, right? What, yeah, I know. What's what's it's, what's next? Yeah. You know, around tackling disparities and equity yeah. in care uh, for CVS. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a there's uh, maybe not obviously, but there's a long way to go on data um, that I mentioned. We're just getting started on that. I think there's a lot to tackle on. Um, I, I'll I'll come to it from two different angles on on. Uh, health equity, writ large, cultural engagement, um, you know, every company, every provider probably has some sort of training um, or something. I think, I think Takesha and Adam would probably um, nod their heads. <laughs> that, that's not great. Um, and I've seen some, some things out, out there from some, some early stage founders on, uh, on really getting at true, uh, two different angles, one on true multicultural engagement, right? Um, something that we, um, we, all of us, the, the health system in general lack um, real true expertise at, um, and there's a lot of opportunity there to pick up, um, you know, significant gains in, in, in health and quality and, um, and fixing some of those social determinants by, by truly, especially from our perspective as a payer, as a, as a, as a, a large pharmacy, 
um, as a large PBM, um, truly cultural engagement. And then really how does that, how do we as 200,000 plus employees show up in that, in that cultural engagement? Um, I think there's, there's opportunity there. You know, I mentioned the other two, I think there's this, um, community-based organization network space is, is, um, is shaking out as, as we, um, see this happening now. So I've been at the, at the front lines of that with, with, um, with the pilots we have with Unite Us, there are, are other great, um, players in, in that space as well. Um, so, you know, at some point we'll have to figure out like who owns what, what pieces of that so that there's not, um, overlapping networks so that you don't have, I mentioned this somebody this morning, so that you don't have five networks in Philadelphia and zero in Kalamazoo, right? Like that's my fear. Um, so that that's going to take some, um, some market forces to shake it out, I think. Uh, uh, and then re really super interested in, in health equity data uh, and engagement, I think are, are two um, up and coming spaces. No, great insights. Uh, we, we are at time. Uh, such a great conversation on such an important topic uh, that, you know, really deserves, you know, the spotlight. Uh, and so really appreciate everyone's time here. Uh, really appreciate our audience's participation in their engagement. Please, you can reach out to us uh, on various platforms. Um, and so with that, thank you to our panelists. And I will kick it back over to you, Arundhati. Thanks so much, Dan, for such a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, what really struck me is how each of your organizations are moving toward a different approach of how healthcare industry should be, how care delivery should be. Um, especially, I really liked uh, the example from Dr. Davis uh, to see how the hospital could be a place where someone could do exercise by uh, walking on the walking path that has been created, as well as the farmer's market where you can get access to good, uh, fresh food. And then for Dr. Myers, the really interesting thing is you talked about how, uh, you know, institutions have been very paternalistic and knowing uh, what is best for a patient. And I think that's really important coming from uh, the enterprise perspective of, of Cleveland Clinic, that listening and partnering with trusted community organizations is so important. And that you may not know everything that a patient needs. And then uh, from RJ, the, the talk about how you're trying to attempt uh, to create a vaccine appointment system where people with the best internet ac uh, access don't get to jump ahead in line and book an appointment to get that uh, vaccine. Um, I think all these are just wonderful efforts and hopefully um, each of these individual efforts will lead to a more uh, equal, a more, um, uh, a better industry that we can all be proud of being part of. Thank you so much again. And thank you to all for watching.